This week on Sneak Previews, Kirstie Alley, the Olsen twins and Steve Gutenberg in It Takes Two. And Emma Thompson and Jonathan Price in a most unusual love story, Carrington. And Cindy Crawford starring debut with William Baldwin in Fair Game. Plus Raging Angels and Kicking and Screaming, all on this week's Sneak Previews. Talking to the horse. It's okay. It's okay. It's okay. It's okay. It's okay. It's okay. I want to kill her. Okay, it's okay. They gave me the killer horse. Relax. You okay? God almighty, I about dropped my transmission back there. Ah, uh, well, it's any consolation. I used to look like a real jerk on a horse. Oh! You know those kids. They're Mary Kate and Ashley Olsen, of course, of TV's Full House. And in the movie It Takes Two, they play look-alike friends trying to spark a romance between young millionaire Steve Gutenberg and Kirstie Alley in this delightful family comedy. One of five new movies we'll review on this week's Sneak Previews. I'm Jeffrey Lyons. And I'm Michael Medved, and we'll take you through It Takes Two in a moment or two. But first, we'll look at Carrington, a very offbeat, real-life love story with Emma Thompson as Dora Carrington, a British painter in the early years of this century. Now, the movie focuses on her passionate, lifelong friendship with Lytton Strachey, a brilliant writer and a committed homosexual. Lytton. Hmm? I love being with you. You're so cold and wise. These last few months, whenever I know I'm going to see you, I get so excited inside. If you were to kiss me again, I don't think I'd mind at all. You know, it's a strange thing. But I'd rather like to. soon moves in with the wildly eccentric writer masterfully played by Jonathan Price but when it comes to sex they both pursue outside involvements with a series of other men eventually Carrington wants to marry a handsome veteran of World War One and to invite him to move into the country house she shares with Strachey but first she must get the approval of her life's companion and best friend I've been meaning to tell you I can't say I really approve of Rex what do you mean as a name that's not my real name and my real name is Reginald. Oh. Myself, I'm very much in favor of Rafe. Rafe Partridge. Rafe Partridge. Sounds very fine, don't you agree? Rafe. Well, I don't agree, because that's just about as exciting as any of this gets, Michael. You use the term wildly eccentric, and Linton Strachey is the only interesting character in the movie here, as played wonderfully, I have to admit, by Jonathan Price. The rest of it, especially Carrington, played by Emma Thompson, she plays her so blandly and so broadly that you wonder why everybody's fascinated by her, and suddenly she goes from man to man, other guys turn up, suddenly she's on a boat with a lover, and you just can't get a handle on her character, why she's so special. It presumes that you'll care about Carrington, and I, for one, didn't. I think she comes across very special on screen. I think everyone does a brilliant job with the acting here. They're very well directed by Christopher Hampton, a first-time director, 
British playwright and well-known screenwriter. of all places, right? That <laughs> yeah. mecca for playwrights, right? But he, he had won an Oscar previously for writing the screenplay to Dangerous Liaisons. And what he does is he recognizes that these are strange people whose lives he's, he's dramatizing. And it's a very strange movie. Sort of there's a very intrusive musical score by Michael Nyman, mm -hmm. who wrote the music for the piano. The whole thing is, is stilted and strange and odd, but it's very appropriate for the story it's telling. But you didn't use the word, curiously, interesting. Oh, Still it's fascinating. Strange is one thing. It wasn't even eccentric. After a time, they talk politics, and there were long scenes where on the beautiful cliffs overlooking the water. He says he's a dedicated pacifist. He doesn't want to go into the war. Didn't you, well, you say they just talk politics. Didn't you find it fascinating when he actually has to report to the yeah, authorities? That was one scene he's here resisting and there. the draft Look, in World War One. There is an elegance here, but I couldn't hold on to any character in particular. The guy she marries is a bit of a lout. Mm -hmm, She's absolutely. not interesting enough in the role, and I just was waiting for something to, to happen that would make me get involved with these characters and wonder what is so fascinating about them and about her in particular that everybody is fawning well, over Well, you talk her. about interest. What is so fascinating to me about the picture is it really is about the distinction between romance and love. And it advances the idea that there can be this absolute life-changing love, this great passion where there's no sex in it. I mean, I, But that's the kind of thing that works well on paper and perhaps by a more cinematic director, by someone who's steeped in a theater the way this director is, it just falls but flat on the screen. this is gorgeously cinematic. It is, you can see, even from the scenes that we showed, that every scene is rather lovingly crafted. If I say, is this a family favorite? Is this a film that makes it sense you out of the theater with a song in your heart? No, no it can it's, it's terribly a... depressing. But I think it's very true catching the spirit of that fascinating Bloomsbury group, including Virginia Woolf and E.M. Forster and so many other great writers. Yeah, they were in it, but they don't turn up here. <laughs> they just have little parts in this. This, I think, rescues a forgotten figure, Dora Carrington, and makes her very compelling. Well, let's turn the page now, and we'll move <laughs> on to a movie called Fair Game. This is the long-awaited and long-delayed feature film debut of Supermodel Cindy Crawford. Turn the page. We're in a different library. This is a thriller <laughs> teaming her with super hunk William Baldwin. You married? No. Divorced? Boyfriend? Living with? Is this going anywhere? I'm just after a suspect profile. No one tried to kill me. This is Miami. I'm local. We only shoot the tourists. But they're also shooting at Crawford, who's supposed to be a tough lawyer who, for reasons never made very clear, becomes the target of ex-KGB agents. Now, if anyone can survive such a series of ordeals with her makeup and her hair intact, it's Cindy Crawford, helped by Baldwin as a fearless Miami cop. Lauren, it's gonna blow! Get ahead of them! Yeah, cut them off! Now you'd think there'd be at least a brief time to make a pit stop or have a bite or to eat or maybe, dare I suggest it, have a conversation. But the movie keeps hurtling us to other stunts as when Baldwin finally decides that Amtrak is the only way to go. One of the great things about this job is the changes in pacing and uh, focus. And what I couldn't help thinking of watching this picture is what if Emma Thompson and Cindy Crawford had switched roles? Wouldn't it be terrific to <laughs> have Cindy Crawford and Carrington and Emma Thompson and Fairgate? Look, Cindy Crawford, I think everybody wants to know, how is she as an actress? She looks great. She screams very, very well. Other than that, 
She's no more embarrassing than everybody else in this terrible movie. Well, Joan Crawford couldn't have made this an interesting <laughs> movie. I don't care how good an actress you put in the role. It's a good Cindy line. Crawford is likable. She's amiable. She's pleasant. Everybody who's ever worked with her professionally, at least on a runway, says she's the nicest person you uh -huh. can imagine. And that comes she across. She should have taken the time to study. There are certain acting teachers, all kidding aside, who specialize in taking models who know how to work in front of a camera, at least, and turning them into rudimentary actresses. She does handle a few of the scenes adequately. I've never seen a lawyer in as many skirt that short uh, yeah. and when in doubt but when you're not, pursued by but when you're pursued by KGB agents her, the remedy of her character takes is go take a shower right. and put on a new t-shirt right, I mean that's right, the right. idiocy of, of this screenplay. change t-shirts incessantly look it there's lots wrong with this picture oh, but, oh, it, but Cindy Crawford isn't it she is less embarrassing in the film than a lot of the other actors Stephen Burkoff plays the villain he always and, plays and, the but villain. reminding me of the old fearless leader in Boris Badenoff in the old Rocky and Bullwinkle Give cartoons. An accent and they're, they're, they're suspects right but, but the problem here is this picture is produced by Joel Silver who was a master of action films and did the Lethal Weapon series and he did the yeah. Die Hard series and he just did Assassins. But what he did here was with a first-time actress like Cindy Crawford, he turned this over to first-time screenwriters and a first-time director who makes a mess of it. it. I've never seen such a badly it, edited film. It's also another of those movies that's in love with weaponry. I mean, look at that close-up <laughs> of that rocket that they showed and the big guns and it's... The stunts are done fairly well, even but, though but they have a credibility the factor themselves are well, of but the minus editing, 50. It's, it's, they're it, incessant, it's though. It's fam famously edited in a mix master. Right, I mean, you can not follow the chase scenes. They're incoherent because it's so choppy. And, and they're look, incessant. And this one scene where uh, Baldwin has to beat up a woman, and I found that very uncomfortable, even though she deserved to be captured, shall we say. But yeah. that, that, that disturbed me, too. That was needless. Well, again, there's lots to dislike in Fair Game. Our next movie is Kicking and Screaming. We've just been doing a bit of Kicking and Screaming. <laughs> and this one is a funny, smart, impressive movie-making debut for a 25-year-old writer-director named Noah Baumbach. Now, Kicking and Screaming is about four male friends who graduate together from college and then don't know what to do with their lives other than playing trivia games the night of their graduation party. Can you name me eight movies where monkeys play a key role? Dick! Uh, going ape. Monkeys. Mighty Joe Young. For all of our sakes, I hope Monkey Trouble. Uh, uh, you know, in a few hours... King Kong. Was the, all King, the other King Kong. Eight hours ago, I was Max Belmont, uh, English major, college the, senior. A femme monkey now. now. I am Max monkey. Belmont, who does not. Never what are you talking again. about? Monkeys, monkeys, what do I Ted do? and Alice. I do nothing. All my accomplishments are in the past. Monkeys. Okay. Monkeys is a stupid subject. Yeah, monkeys is a stupid. Monkeys is a stupid subject. Yeah. How about name me six empiricist philosophers? Okay, Hume. Ding, ding. Uh, uh, for sake, Hume. Yeah, Skippy, how about worst case ones? scenarios after graduation? Ding. Heart attack. Ding. Live in Milwaukee. Live in Milwaukee. Forget everything you learned. I didn't learn enough in the first place to forget. Honey, you did not ding in, and this is definitely not for juniors. I'm sorry, I was completely out of line there. Ding, forget everything you learned. That's Parker Posey as the girlfriend who's still a junior who's losing patience with her aimless, significant other, Jason Wiles. Let's talk about your friends. Let's talk about how... You guys are all in love with each other and how sick you make me with your stupid games, those trivia games. Ding, Max loves Grover. Ding, Skippy does Otis. Ding, they all do each other and, and it drives me nuts. Ding that, Skippy, get a life. Nice time store psychoanalysis. You know what, I can't stand you. I can't stand that. You know, your, your shoes, your pants, that shirt you're wearing your hair your hair drives me crazy just get out okay i have homework to do just get out get out get out 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 go go out this is a very witty and intelligent movie about a very difficult time in young people's lives when they finished four years of rigorous work in college and what do they have to show for besides a sheepskin? They're going to start at the bottom of the ladder in any or company they join and it's a very scary time and you sit around and be cynical but it's a, lot of, uh, it's a movie filled with a lot of intelligent observations. Well, they're, they're reluctant to move on in life. It's sort of uh, the idea of kicking and screaming is you have to be dragged kicking and screaming into the real world. Right. That's the title. And one of the things that I found such a joy in this picture is it's full of intelligent talk. 
And uh, it's going to remind a lot of people of Whit Stillman's movies, films like Barcelona and Metropolitan. And in fact, the star of those two films, Chris Eigeman, is here playing one of the characters. These are not the most pleasant people in the world. They seem a bit shallow, but they sure have a lot of witty things to say. And you know, Noah Baumbach, who's the writer and the director, is the son of a film critic for The Village Voice. Now, either because of that or despite that, he has a very good idea of the message he wants to convey. And he's not afraid to use first-time screen actors like Carlos Jacot, the guy on the left there mm -hmm. who was afraid of uh, going back to Milwaukee. He's wonderful. And Josh Hamilton is very witty. In one scene, he goes to an airline office, and he wants to go to Czechoslovakia, where his girl has gone for an extended period of time. And he's shocked that the, all the planes are full. And he says, but it, why does everybody, everybody's been to Czechoslovakia. Why do they want to go there? And he doesn't have a passport. And you feel for the guy. Your heart breaks for him. There's a word that a lot of critics use often, which is the word bittersweet. This is almost a definition of a movie that's bittersweet. It is funny. It's painful. Elliot Gould turns up playing the father yeah. of, who's a recently divorced father of one of these young men. And in a way, it's almost a classic Eric Stoltz movie. I mean, it's the kind He's of movie you associate say, with right. Eric Stoltz. He'd been before and Say Anything and Sleep With Me and Bodies Rest in Motion. And sure enough, there he is, he's playing a bartender who also can't leave this little college town, is taking classes perpetually, and almost as sort of a philosopher commenting on the other people in the film. It, very good job yeah, for him. It's very tough to convey this sort of emotion on an extended basis, and I think this film does it. It's called Kicking and Screaming, and, and I won't soon forget it. Well, our next movie is called Raging Angels, and it has an intriguing cast. There's Michael Pere of Eddie and the Cruisers, Shelley Winters, Diane Ladd, and Sean Patrick Flannery, who has the title role in the current hit, powder, despite our reviews, and a 17-year-old newcomer named Monet Mazur. Flannery is desperate to get his girlfriend back after she's gotten involved with a rock musician who secretly heads a satanic cult. With its bizarre powers, the cult can control the police and even create some strange and sinister illusions. Michael Pere plays the head of the rock and roll New World Order cult called the Coalition for World Unity. But there's little unity with Sean Patrick Flannery, who's undaunted in his efforts to get his girlfriend back. Diane Ladd plays a faith healer who tries to help Flannery. But in this scene, this distinguished Oscar-nominated actress is soon upstaged by an even bigger star. Stop it in God's name! You know, Jeffrey, recently there have been a series of hugely popular novels by an author named Frank Peretti. The best known of them is maybe called This Present Darkness, and they're all about sort of the way the demons impact on human life and their battles between demons and angels. And I think that this film is an attempt, without paying Frank Peretti at all, to sort of capitalize on the popularity of that work. It's not a very competent attempt. I mean, <laughs> not at all. You know, I once asked Vincent Price, what's the worst film you were in? And he mentioned some film, and he said, during the shooting of the film, an actor turned to him and said, what in God's name are we doing in this movie? I have the feeling that Diane Ladd and Shelley Wynn just had a lot of those conversations. You know, acting is a profession with 90% unemployment at any given time. Actors sometimes have to do these silly movies to pay the rent, to get in front of a camera as a favor. Who knows what? This is the dopiest, <laughs> most hackneyed, silly little movie I've ever seen. Wait, wait, again, the special effects aren't all that no, bad. No, surprisingly it's, good. And you know what? I will say that I thought Sean Patrick Flannery, who I hated in Powder, was somewhat better, better here. here. Of course, because yeah, he doesn't course. look like this, this weird creature right, as he well, did and, in Powder. And, you know, he doesn't have, but also the performance isn't nearly as mannered. And this new star, Monet Mazur, was all of 17 when she made the picture. She has sort of an interesting screen presence, but there's a a, a sort of a telltale sign about this film is it's credited to a director named Alan Smithy. And the uh, sort of convention in the industry is when a director forces to have his name taken away from oh, a movie, always, right? he's named as Alan Smithy. So that's an <laughs> alias. 
and I don't think anybody else needs to have an alias associated with Raging Angels, but it is a very tough movie to recommend. The problem really is the script. There's no dramatic structure. It's just, you know, there's this evil cult and there are these demons, and it just goes absolutely nowhere. Yeah, it's also something you've seen before, all sorts of cult movies and a guy trying to get somebody out of the cult. It's the kind of movie I'm glad I've seen, because years from now I'm when I meet... I'm just surprised saying, you say that. Because years from now when I see any of these actors or run into them or interview them, whatever, I'll say, tell me about this movie, Raging Angels, and I just want to see the expression on their face. They'll probably smite me with a sword, too. <laughs> All right, well, our family find this week is No, Not Rangy Angels. This is a delightful new film that's just opening up in theaters across the country, and it's called It Takes Two. And this film manages to weave together some sturdy, familiar plot elements from both The Parent Trap and The Prince and the Pauper. Steve Gutenberg plays a wealthy widower who shocks his daughter, played by nine-year-old Ashley Olsen, with plans to marry a conniving social climber. Meanwhile, Kirstie Alley plays a social worker, assigned to a very different little girl, an orphan, played by Mary Kate Olsen. And then, one summer day, these two little girls from very different worlds literally bump into each other. But what I see is me. I see me too. They take advantage of their unexplained physical resemblance to switch places with a tough orphan girl seeing what it's like to be a pampered heiress for a few weeks. Hello. Hello, dear. Good evening. Good evening. How swell of you to come. <laughs> so nice to see you. Nice to see you. Like my dress? <laughs> I love Very nice. Dress. Escargo, Miss Calloway. Why, thank you, waiter person. I'm starving. I mean, I'd adore one. This tastes like a balloon. It's snails, miss. Good. Nice. Chewy. All this money and these people eat slugs? While the two girls what? plot and no, plan to throw Steve Gutenberg and Kirstie Alley together, to Jane Sibbett, who nearly steals the movie as the prospective stepmother from hell, isn't about to give up her plans for marriage. Right now, it's too soon. Maybe I didn't make myself clear. We're leaving tonight. This little act of yours is getting old. What act? Oh, please. By the time I was your age, I'd been through three stepmothers, so I know all about the lengths that little girls will go through to keep Daddy all to themselves. Hey, you got that all wrong, lady. Alyssa, don't be rude. I am talking. And where was I? Oh, yes. <clears throat> you have had Roger to yourself for nine wonderful years, but after tomorrow, I'm the woman of the house, and you're off to a year-round boarding school. Possibly in Tibet. <laughs> I'm sure Richard Gere wouldn't mind, but you know, Michael, this is the th you like that. But you know, Michael, this is the third uh, Steve Gutenberg movie I've seen in about three days mm -hmm. after The Pig Green and Home for the Holidays. This one's easily the best because it's charming without trying to be charming. Mm -hmm. It does combine the Prince and the Pauper and uh, the Parent Trap, and the Olsen twins are not. First of all, they're twins. They don't have one girl playing right, two parts, right. and they're they're delightful. They're not overly cute they're, professional they're so kids. They're so natural yeah, on screen. Even they're though they don't explain, old. they don't explain. At least maybe I missed it. They don't explain exactly why they look exactly alike. Well, Mark Twain doesn't explain that in Prince well, of the Pauper either. Well, that's true, too. But uh, this film is a delight, and it's aimed, again, at the audience that was aimed, that was the intended audience of the Gold Diggers that we did a while ago, or last week, I should say. That film was annoying. This film has none of the sinister elements mm -hmm. of that. This is a delightful, harmless family find. Everybody is going to come out of this picture, adults and children, feeling great. Yeah, it's a film. It's, it's it's Andy Tennant, who's a first-time director, who, by the way, himself just had triplets, apparently. His Some first irony children. in that, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, we're working Maybe with twins. Maybe a movie about triplets, right? Well, and then the anyway, right? uh, Andy Tennant makes these images full of sunlight and color, and it's sort of a storybook feel to it. It's a very old-fashioned movie, but I think what you mentioned, Steve Gutenberg, he has a real gift and a real flair for physical comedy. He and Kirstie Alley have real romantic sparks. They both come across as two of the most likable people in the entire world, I, and that helps right. the movie a lot. I think that's Kirstie Alley's strong suit here, too, and in anything she does. I mean, you want to like her. She doesn't have a guy. She's looking, and here's this nice guy who happens to live in an 800 room mansion. Right. He's the cellular phone king, I right. think. And, and he, you like him. And he is he's adorable. Not... You can't not like yeah. any of these people. One of the things I think that mothers are going to like particularly in this film is the villainess, who's beautifully played by Jane Sibbett, who's appeared on Friends. She's very, very funny. The villainess is very curvaceous, very svelte. 
and the heroine, the good woman, mm -hmm. is has sort of more realistic proportions in terms of many Americans. You said that. I'm not going to get into that. Well, now to summarize our reviews on all the films we covered this week. I don't believe you said that. Our best bet is also our family find. It takes two, a delightful picture that's well acted and skillfully directed and will leave parents and kids feeling great. There's no language, sex, or violence to bother even the youngest audience. But we split strongly on Carrington. I thought it was pretentious, tedious, cold, and remote. And it leaves too many unanswered questions about its complicated relationships. But Michael was so impressed by the acting, especially by Jonathan Price, that he felt the film draws you deeply into its sad, true story. Carrington is rated R for some harsh language and a few surprisingly graphic sex scenes. We agree that Fair Game, the new Cindy Crawford movie, isn't even fair. It's downright poor and so badly edited that the incessant chase scenes are often totally incoherent. As you'd expect from this kind of action thriller, there's lots of harsh language, one moderately steamy sex scene, and lots of badly staged violence. But we both felt that Kicking and Screaming is a funny, intelligent, witty, and bittersweet romantic comedy about that awkward year which begins right after college graduation. The young actors work superbly with each other, but the real star is 25-year-old director Noah Baumbach. It's rated R for lots of street language and many sex scenes with a good deal of nudity. Raging Angels is ambitious, given its low budget, but it has a badly paced script, which is difficult to follow, some stilted acting, and hokey special effects. There's some tough language and one clumsy sex scene that seems endless, along with lots of demonic violence. So that's it for this week's show. Please join us next time when we review GoldenEye, the big new James Bond spectacular with Pierce Brosnan, and White Man's Burden. That's an explosive picture about racism with John Travolta and Harry Belafonte and The American President, a White House romance with Michael Douglas and Annette Bening, plus Reckless with Mia Farrow, and The Crossing Guard with Jack Nicholson, as directed by Sean Penn, all on the next Sneak Previews. I'm Michael Medved. And I'm Jeffrey Lyons. And until next time on Sneak Previews, don't forget to save us the aisle seats.